I'm Luka Muzinic, I come from Zagreb. Uh, I am a developer, whatever that means these days. Um, I also have been a teacher uh, for quite a few years. I've been teaching my students web development. So some of my old teaching habits still exist. Uh, I may ask you some questions. I may yeah, call your parents to come to the next webcam. Uh, so yeah, please, please behave. So this is roughly our plan for today. We're going to talk uh, about Lua, a little bit about uh, microservices, and then mention uh, Nginx and, and Redis. So let's not waste time. Let's dive right in in Lua. Um, so this nice little logo actually represents the moon. Uh, so Lua is actually moon in Portuguese. Uh, whole language comes from Brazil. It was invented in the Polytechnic University of Brazil as their uh, solution for uh, little embedded software that they could use in telecom industries. Uh, so that kind of gives away what Lua really is. It's a very powerful, fast, lightweight, and embedded scripting, scripting language. So you might, might uh, ask yourselves, uh, where can you find Lua? And I'm pretty sure that you are familiar at least with one uh, term on the screen. So for example, if you ever use some sort of photo manipulation software uh, or play the game of uh, Angry Birds uh, used uh, to, if you've written your own tab for, uh, for Wireshark, you probably used Lua in, in some way. And also, if you browse to Wikipedia that uses Lua for a templating engine, you can also say that you've been using Lua in, in some way. Um, as, we, as with any language, I guess, these days, uh, people have love and hate relationship uh, with Lua. But what I come to conclude, it's still, still better than, than JavaScript. As my uh, friend Nicola says, uh, that Lua is a language that JavaScript should look like if somebody gives it more, more thought. Um, just kidding, JS guys, love you. So Lua is really, really, really light in, in features. Um, her features are uh, designed so they can be extended to solve different problems instead of Lua making you use it um, in a strict specification way or um, use me like through, through these patterns. Um, it's a dynamically typed language. Um, you have numbers stored as uh, double point floats, so you can store big integers in there. And from some complicated structures, you have tables which are something like arrays in PHP or dictionaries in, in, in Python. Also, you have this fancy word for just string comparison. So coercion is uh, allowing you to uh, compare apples and oranges, so strings and numbers, great thing. Um, you also have coroutines, so if you go, want to go uh, be nasty with uh, uh, threads and everything, you can do that. And yeah, standard garbage collection and everything. So at, at the first glance, you could say that um, Lua lacks classes, it lacks namespaces, all that yeah, inheritance and fancy object-oriented stuff. Uh, but as I mentioned, the, the, the Lua is not dictating you anything, so you can actually use tables as um, a replacement for those. So if you're familiar with PHP, you probably recognize the class on the, on the left, and the same thing is actually re represented with, with the tables in Lua just by uh, having some little bit more of uh, boilerplate code and meta tables and everything. So you can simulate classes, you can simulate namespaces uh, with clever use of, use of tables. And running Lua is really, uh, really easy. You could say uh, that being, the, being, Lua, uh, being a scripting language, it is interpreted, interpreted but it's not. Uh, it's been compiled into bytecode and then run into a virtual machine. And at first glance, it seems like a big complication, but it's also uh, being done in runtime, so it's that the whole process is in invisible to a user. You just have to write the source code. Uh, but that approach also allows you 
uh, to be able to change certain things, like change the VM that's been uh, running the code. Uh, so for example, when they switched the Lua to version 5.1, they switched the machine from um, stack-based uh, virtual machine to register-based, and they get the like 40% of, of improvements. Um, also, when uh, I don't know the name of the guy that uh, wrote Luajit, uh, he also decided, he said, oh crap, this can be much, much better, and they just wrote his own um, interpreter, and yeah, now we have uh, even, more, even more performance in, in, in Lua. The ecosystem of a language is also pretty much uh, important thing to decide if you are going to use the language or not. Um, currently, you have uh, plugins for almost every popular uh, text editor. So if you're using Vim or, or Sublime, you'll have some fancy stuff like code completion. And if you decide to go with a more round uh, development environment, you will have uh, debuggers, code analyzers, and such stuff. So you won't be left behind. You won't be. Uh, you, you don't have to work in just in, in, in Notepad. Um, Lua also has a solid package manager, Lua Rocks, and uh, the choice of packages is really really diverse. So you have uh, busted if you are looking into unit tests and TDD, Spetzel for BDD and many, many, many others. If you look at Tiobe, the index, it's not the most popular language, not at all. It's not front page material. Um, but there are repositories on GitHub. There are questions on Stack Overflow, so people are using it. If you uh, log into Freenode channel and um, ask for help, there are around 100 developers at a time that probably can, can help you. So even if it's less popular, maybe you can use it to your advantage. Uh, know some, something that not the people know. And probably at this point, we can all agree that Lua is great. Uh, but I'm not preaching here that you should start rewriting your applications to Lua. So don't come in the office on Monday and say, hey, are we throwing everything away? We are writing everything from scratch in Lua because Lucas told us so. Don't, please don't do that because your bosses will hate me. I'm just quickly going to uh, go through microservices as, as a concept to see how the Lua fits in that model. Um, I'm not going to give you a definition of microservices because there are people that did it far, far better than me. Um, if you read about those guys, maybe you have, maybe you didn't, but I'm a teacher, so this is your reading list, reading assignment for next web camp. So um, look into them. Um, they all mention microservices, service-oriented architecture, hexagonal architecture, blah, 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 a lot of um, fancy buzzwords. Uh, but basically, it boils down to this. If I show you some piece of code, if I show you some architecture, uh, you could probably tell me if it's uh, based around microservices or not. You could probably recognize certain microservices. Uh, also, if I show you a big, big monolithic application, you should probably recognize that it's big and monolithic, right? I mean, does anybody have that sort of application? Okay, so the people that pull their hands up for having a face, and that face is frustration. I mean, with big applications, when you have a little change, you have to go through the long compile times, long deployments, and sometimes for developers, that's great. We can go like chair fencing. What are you doing? You're slacking off. No, no, we're, it's, it's compiling. Oh, okay, go back to work. Uh, so sometimes it works for us, but in... In most cases, it's, it's, it's really, really frustrating. Um, also, scaling is quite interesting because you can't scale a certain part of application. You have to scale the whole server. Um, for example, I was um, using one um, application that has a big, big, uh, big file storage for, for images. And every time that we ran out of space, we purchased a new server. So we were getting lots of RAM, a lot of CPU, that we actually didn't use. And also, um, a problem that is common with either PHP or Ruby Python developers is that everybody has their own language, their own stack, and you are just so focused into your, um, your stack that you are 
solving everything just by using that stack. You're not looking anywhere else. And that, um, that is what I'm preaching today, uh, for you to be open to other languages, uh, for, example, for example, Lua. Because Lua plays well with other services that are there. Uh, namely, one of those services is Nginx. So let's see how Lua and Nginx can yeah, move you away from those monolithic applications. And just to give you ideas, how you can refactor parts of your application uh, into microservices. So our good friend Nginx, um, we have it in a multiple array of services. My first um, encounter of Nginx was he is just serving static files and forwarding everything extra Apache, but people use it for, for proxying, for load balancing, everything. Your setup is probably something like that. You have Nginx and some pool of workers which are just handling your stuff and returning, returning the results. And that is great because, yeah, Nginx with its low memory footprint, stability and everything is, is yeah, working pretty, pretty much okay. But you also have downsides to that approach because you are encountering blocking situations and even if you have hundreds and hundreds of workers, there is a number that you can run out of. So if you combine Nginx with Lua, you have all the benefits of event system of uh, Nginx, but you will also have Lua JIT uh, compiler in there to run the Lua. You can have shared data between requests, and you have a non-blocking uh, I.O. So for example, if you are accessing some, some resource that just sleeps for one, one second, and you have one worker and 10 concurrent requests, that will take 10 seconds of time, of course. But with Lua, as soon as she detects a blocking I.O., she will put this, work, put this process aside, take a new one. So the same amount of requests in, um, will, will take about a second and a little bit more. So that's quite, quite nice. Um, if you want to get started with uh, Nginx and Lua, I suggest you look into OpenResty, which is a bundle that bundles Nginx and Lua and all the Lua models that you, that you need. Um, you leverage the event model and the non-blocking I.O. You have the full or almost full access to the Nginx API, um, depending on the phase you are in, of course. Um, so you can yeah, uh, run uh, code and ask some services like Redis and everything um, through the uh, request being handled. So if we simplify the Nginx phases, uh, we can, our, as our request goes through all those phases, uh, for each phase we have also integration point which, which, where we can put the Lua, uh, Lua in action. So for example, if you have access phase, you can say access by Lua or access by Lua file and then give it to Lua to do something. So if you take look at the Nginx configuration and say, okay, in the access phase, please um, take, the, take a look at Lua file and do what she does. And in Lua, you just connect to a Redis server, ask for a set of IPs, and if the um, remote IP is in there, then just, yeah, give it the 403, you can't access that. So it's, it's very easy for your application to be upgraded with, um, for example, blacklisting. Uh, if a user uh, misses like three or five uh, logins, yeah, be very, be Nazi about it and just block everything. So um, usages of Lua and Redis, that sort of marriage, come to some sort of check-in permissions, access throttling, uh, you can manipulate headers, um, you can also avoid the application call entirely and just fetch everything from Redis and return that. Um, if you have a person uh, collecting statistics through uh, Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana, and you dump the uh, log in as a JSON format with the cookies, they, they will love you. So that sort of things you can get out of, uh, out of Lua and, and Nginx. Uh, Redis is also one great player that we have in web development. Um, you probably all use it at a certain point, especially if you have 
a little bit of a distributed uh, system to store some sessions. Um, Redis, as we know, is a data structure store. It's fast because everything is, is, every, everything is in memory. And what I especially like about Redis is this um, guarantee of atomicity. So, for example, if you're incrementing a certain, certain key, no other uh, process will yeah, get in the way. Um, so the key will be atomically uh, incremented. And Redis also has support for, for Lua scripting, so you can run Lua inside, inside Redis. Um, how, it, how it looks like, um, the same guarantee for uh, atomicity uh, is applicable here, so no other script can mess with, mess with, your, um, mess with your current current script until it's finished. That has a downside because you have to be beware of slow scripts. If the script is slow, you won't be accessing nothing. Um, so take care of that. Um, also, you have to learn the conversion between uh, data types because Redis uses a certain set of data types and Lua uh, sets the, uh, uses the other. Um, for example, Lua, um, you, have to return, uh, you have to return strings, um, the floats as strings because Redis does that. And if you return nil uh, to Lua, Lua, Lua uses nil to unset the variable. So if you are returning nil from, from Redis, it kind of confuses and breaks the whole thing. So how to run Lua in Redis? There is one uh, command that you can use. Um, don't be scared. It's, this is a safe environment. Uh, you may be you may been taught that this is a very dangerous command, and in other languages it is. Um, so yeah, use it like this, and it's very easy. So if you're using some sort of uh, client or just calling it through the CL through the console, you will just run the script as a as a complete file. And what this script concretely does. Uh, if you give it a number, she will return you the running average of all, all the numbers that you have um, pushed to push that script, and everything will be done in just one, one pass. So usages of uh, Lua, inside, uh, Lua inside of Redis are more like helper functions, something that will help your development. Please don't think of um, yeah, let's build an MVC framework inside inside of Redis because no, no that's that's not going to work. Um, especially if you want to uh, do something and then log something, that's pretty pretty useful. And if you are running any sort of um, statistics, how many stars some post was given to, or something like that, um, all those averages will will come come in handy. Uh, also, if you need some sort of debugging, uh, if you've been to last webcamp, Marian Schufleig gave an excellent talk about the debugging Lua and debugging Redis, so uh, look into that as well. So I told you I was a teacher, so there is some homework involved. Sorry. Sorry. Um, so please, please, until next webcamp, um, I want you to step out of your comfort zone and comfort zone being your framework of choice or a language that you are really comfortable with. And just yeah, start experimenting with, um, with other things. Um, everybody experiments in college. So try different languages, try different frameworks. Um, I'm also not saying that all applications should be built like the microservices way. And I'm also not saying that you should build uh, your applications um, as, a, as a monolithical, just please, uh, be open to other options um, because it will allow you to um, find something that will fit your company both in a technological way and, and in the people way that people will yeah, be uh, glad that they can use. And um, yeah, that will generally allow you not to dig yourself into one solution. You will not become like a racehorse that is blindsided. Uh, focused only on one solution, because I really, really want you to be a free horse running around, looking beautiful, as always. <laughs> so thank you for your attention. Uh, 
Uh, you've probably seen this slide from other, other speakers. Um, I kindly ask for your feedback to leave um, at uh, join in. It will help me improve this presentation, and it will also help me level up um, as a speaker. So, okay, Luca. Q &A. Thank, you. Thank you, Er. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Please, questions, raise your hand. You need microphone because you will be recorded. Please, raise your hand. Here we go, first question. Um, what's your take on deploying microservices and how does Lua compare to other languages or other like architectures perform when deploying microservices? Um, yeah, I practically haven't noticed anything um, uh, complicated about it, um, especially as you embed the embed the Lua into configuration files or just embed into or, or just place it in a in a separate file. So it's sort of just having a separate um, GitHub uh, repository for for that and restart the Nginx server and you're, you're good to go. Uh, some people kid that uh, microservices are just uh, an idea from GitHub so they can sell more, um, more uh, yeah, bigger accounts because you'll use them for, um, because you'll use more uh, repositories. But yeah, technically no problems. Any more questions? I had a question actually. Uh, you mentioned, uh, I think, Open Footy was that the name of the, the oh. Nginx Quick Start? Open Resty. Open Resty. Okay. Um, with that software, uh, that's downloadable for free, right? Yeah. Okay. That's basically it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Easy question. <laughs> in in your example uh, with the access control, uh, I noticed that that it opened a Redis connection. Okay. Uh, does it open a new Redis connection for every HTTP request? Yeah. Or I is there a way to I'd keep uh, it reuse? open? Yeah, I think it opens one for each each request. I I would have to dig into it if you can keep the connection permanent. Yeah.